What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York. We are on the tour bus outside the Brooklyn Monarch, and today we are here with Grayson Stewart of Norma Jean. Thanks for being here. Yeah, dude, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so awesome to have you here. I got to tell you, your new al album, Death Rattle Sing for Me, is absolutely kick-ass. Was there sort of like a preconceived vision behind this album? Was the intention to just like continue where you left off after All Hail, or was this sort of like a new beginning for Norma Jean in a way? Uh, a little bit of both, for sure. We like we never really stop writing. So there's always that process going on behind the scenes. So even before All Hail came out, some of the singles that ended up on this record were already written at that point also. So, but the album as a whole and the concepts behind all of it, that was something that kind of developed later on as the next two years went by and the rest of the song started forming because that's what really formed you know, the whole piece of the puzzle. And so this, even the songs that we wrote before All Hail came out, those found their place once everything else was put in context with itself. Did these songs like change a lot over a long span of time in a way, or do, are some of the songs kind of like staying as they initially were written in like 2019? The only one that stayed pretty consistent is, um, uh, I, I can only think of the working title right now. Uh, <laughs> working title. Hold on really quick. <laughs> I remember, remember my own song name. You're making me feel better about not having to use a cheat sheet. Dude, that's the thing. It's like you get used to calling him something for so long, and you're like, what is this song actually called? The file name. Sleep, sleep Explosion, sorry. Yeah. yeah, but that song was one of the first ones that I wrote in 2019. And, yeah, that one stayed probably like 85 90% the same. But then everything else, like the process that we normally go through when writing, there's like 10 revisions of each song most of the time. So it might be small things here and there, just layers that we either take in or put in or take out. But as a whole, like it all morphs as the whole record goes along to make it all more cohesive for sure. Well, as somebody who's listened to Norma Jean for many years, like I think the first song, and I know you weren't on this album, but like when I first heard Distance to Planets, and then, you know, you listen, and then, you know, you go along the whole catalog, I think it's fair to say Norma Jean is a fairly experimental band, so that's got to make it kind of, that's got to allow for some flexibility to bring in some new things, right? Absolutely, and the way that I look at it is like each record is more of like a green light for the next one, so there's things that they started doing on Polar Similar that were a first, and they... It was more of like their first step into some of the more ambient sides of that of a lot of what we do now and so on all hail we really got to expand on that and make it like a, a larger part of what our collective sound is and then death rattle is the same thing there's things that we started doing on all hail that we continued over on this record but just in a lot larger sense of it and that's that's how it will always be you know there's things we did on death rattle that the stuff we're already working on for next time it's because we allowed ourselves to like open that gate with the past record. Well, one major difference I've noticed between All Hail and Death Rattle is actually the song lengths. Like, I know that on Death Rattle you end with Heartache, which is like more of an eight minute song, but then like I know that there were some songs on All Hail that are like even under a minute in a way. Was that at all like intentional to sort of differentiate in that? It definitely wasn't intentional. Um, I think that it was more of we were so unsure of what the future would look like like in terms of singles in terms of touring kind of really how everything worked because that was all right in the middle of covid so all the rules you know when you're writing songs for a record and trying to pick singles you want to make them like the songs that can get played on the radio and have a certain time length on them and we just kind of didn't ever have any of those things in our head because we're like well we're just going to make a record that sounds exactly like what we want to do here because who knows if it'll ever even come out? Who knows if we'll ever actually get to tour it? So it was really just like us doing exactly what we wanted to do. I know it's kind of cliche to ask like what the record name means, but was Death Rattle Sing to me at all like a Pantera reference in a way? Yeah, <laughs> you're the first person that's got that too. Um, not like conceptually, but I remember I, that's my favorite band. So I listen to them all the time. And that song that you're referring to, I've always loved that word. And I just wanted to come up with a phrase that had that in it. And the phrase itself does have a lot of meaning to us, like emotionally and personally and things like that. But it does somewhat stem from Pantera, yeah. Did, are you like me, and did you discover that song through when it was on SpongeBob? No, I didn't. I actually didn't know that was on SpongeBob. It was, and that's how I discovered Pantera. Hell yeah, dude, that's yeah. awesome. So th I just wanted, I, I'm still yet to find that one brother who also discovered Pantera in that way. Yeah, no, mine, my discovery of him was more from like guitar magazines and all that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, 
dime bag with that freaking Dean guitar. I mean, that's an iconic, right? Yeah, yeah. He's my favorite player, and like I could never pull off playing one of those things, but he makes it look really fucking cool for sure. And he makes it look easy too. He does make it look very easy. That's the sickest thing about him. He's like the smoothest guitar player, like in the way he speaks, but also in like his playing. He's playing crazy shit, but he never looks like he is. You know, it's so easy watching him. And just to think that those are like blues riffs that he's playing and he's just making them so groovy. They are. That's the thing with like him and Zach Wilde also. Like it's all just pentatonic stuff that they like mess around with and will change one note here or there. And like Dime would do really weird shit too where like the song's in one key and then only the solo just completely flips to another key or he'll play like in a major key for a second. He always did this really weird and unconventional th- stuff. And that's half of the reason why I love him so much. Hell yeah. Uh, When you came into Norma Jean for the making of All Hail, were you looking at, like, the earlier materials, such as, like, uh, Anti-Mother or Wrongdoers, and being like, okay, this is how I have to play? Or were you kind of given full range with Corey to sort of, like, bring a lot of your own mix into Norma Jean? Uh, I mean, those records, specifically Wrongdoers and Anti-Mother, were, like, huge for me as a kid growing up. Um, So they definitely had a huge impact on me, and years before I was in the band the gear that I acquired was always gear that I saw these dudes using so I kind of just tried to set myself up stylistically and gear wise to be in this band so once you know I got to step in and start making my like imprint on it a lot of it was already based in those old records and learning how to play them but some of it also came from like what I wanted as a fan to hear from the band next you know so I'm trying to come at it from a fan but also as a member who's trying to like make the band stick out and continue to like carve away at the legacy that you know they started 20 years ago when you play like the older material does it maybe resonate with you or feel differently for you than if you were playing stuff off of death rattle or all hail or being that you know it's still norma jean you're still killing it that maybe you kind of approach it in a very similar way yeah um it's different for sure because the songs off all hail and death rattle you know there was a lot of personal memories that I have from writing those songs like on my couch in my house or some of the lyrics that Corey like will take and incorporate into the song sometimes he whoever writes the song he'll let them add in lines here or there to make it even more personal to them so there's lines in certain songs like Landslide Defeater off All Hail and, and some other songs off Death Rattles also that like have really really deep not good things attached to them so that is its own feeling of course when you see like a room full of people room full of people singing that along with you it's a very like humbling feeling and also like surreal but then when i play the older songs it's a it's a cool feeling because i know how much those songs mean to fans of this music in general and i feel very lucky that i get to continue presenting them to the fans Corey is a remarkable vocalist, and not just in terms of style, but those lyrics and how they resonate with people. Working with him, could a lyrical idea maybe help guide your hand with regard to how you write riffs and solos? Absolutely, and that's what he does a really good job of, like trying to keep the intent of the song like um, a factor. And when we're creating it in the studio, he'll you know pull you aside and ask like, "What did this mean when you wrote this? What are you feeling about this section here or there?" And, um, or, you know, sometimes we'll do the same thing with him. If some of the lyrics are already there and we know what the vocals are doing, when you know the intent behind something and if it's some like really heavy, dark shit, you're going to play differently. So, and that's something that like we try to play off of because that's something that I think drew me to these records early on before I was in the band anyways, was they sound different because they're played different. It's not like some virtuoso sitting there just nailing every riff and playing as many notes as he can like there's a lot of like mess ups and there's a lot of like you know squeaks and cracks all over the place but that's what makes those records sound the way they do and that's something that i never ever want to leave from the records that i get to continue making with them do you have to almost kind of like is it almost like a different technique if you're playing uh you know to aggressive vocals versus clean vocals do you almost feel like it's a different hand altogether yeah absolutely especially with like some of the older riffs where it's more of like a a feeling or a vibe rather than like technical proficiency you almost have to like figure out how to play stuff shitty the right way and like there's certain strings that you can let ring out that shouldn't technically be ringing out or there's certain sounds that are like you want to come out from your hand moving or things like that and then when it gets to the clean stuff 
most of that is you know the past three records so the songs have become a little bit more dialed in and the riffs sometimes might be a little bit more technical so it kind of goes hand in hand with like where the discography is the older shit takes more of just like the vibe of flip playing so your right hand is more of like trying to create an overall like emotion of of messiness and roughness and then with the clean stuff it is a lot more articulate and precise because when you're playing with that kind of tone and you have a delay pedal on it if you hit one wrong note or make one wrong sound it's just going to keep going and going and going and you can't hide from it yeah. you know that's that's not pressuring at all right no not at all <laughs> yeah i've never hit a wrong note either and done that yeah. sure right yeah. <laughs> yeah i've had like i don't even know how many probably hundreds on this tour yeah it goes to show we're all human right yeah absolutely yeah and but when it comes to like when i hear the guitar work in both all hail and death rattle there's a ton of emotion in the riffs and in the uh, you know i could tell that you put your heart into it do you and Corey almost kind of need to be in the same emotional headspace when writing together in order to make the songs sound consistent or could maybe all of you feeling differently maybe actually help add to your already eclectic sound maybe a little bit of contrast I think that we don't have to be in the exact same headspace. I think when you're writing music like this in general, you're probably coming from somewhere in the same ballpark at least. But then when we get down to like specifics, you know, there's things that he's going to be dealing with that I'm not vice versa. And especially making death rattle, there's a lot of periods where like we would be flip flopping almost in terms of like our emotional state. So it's a lot of like me pulling him to here and then him, pulling me over there sometimes to kind of make the two worlds where me and him and his brother, his brother Matt is super involved in the record also. And, um, and he, you know, had his own whole wheelhouse of emotions and things going on. So it's a lot of like our individual experiences coming together while also like pulling each other into the one that you're personally experiencing. And it, it creates the whole piece, I think. In order to get like that inspiration or that creative fire, like is that something you technically seek out? Like, can you seek out inspiration, or does inspiration kind of strike to you and strike you when you least expect it? It's both. Like, there's there's songs that I think you can write, songs that I've written that are just inspired by listening to bands that I really like, or you know, hearing a record that I like some element of it a lot, and I want to recreate that, and that's a different kind of inspiration. But then there's some things that aren't going to come out unless me or Corey or, or anybody is like just going through some shit and so there's there's two sides of that coin I guess it can go either way there was a lot more of the going through some stuff on this record rather than just sitting down and listening to Pantera or Alice in Chains and being like okay cool I feel inspired to make a whole record you know most of the time when when I personally would sit down in my my home studio to start the ideas before bringing it to Corey it was a lot of anger it was a lot of like almost like vengefulness coming from where i was at and like that translated into the playing and into some of the riffs and honestly into probably some of the links of the songs that you're talking about because i was just trying to pack in so much into a single song so that's the best that i can probably narrow that down for you <laughs> Well, you know, I've always said that when emotions, positive or negative, is the source of inspiration, that sometimes artists can become, like, victim of their own product in a way. So, like, obviously it's very cathartic to have, you know, music as a release to uh, release your certain emotions. But do you find that maybe it could sometimes also make the creative process just as deteriorating as it could be cathartic? Absolutely. That's something that I've actually, like, really had to try and come to terms with and figure out how to get myself out of. Because after death rattle was released i had this moment where i was like okay all that all those things that you were feeling and you were concentrated on while you're making that record like you did you did it now the the whole thing that you poured yourself into to try and solve those problems is now completed and i realized i was still feeling a lot of those same things that i was going through or that we were going through while making the record and i was like i can't stay in this state you know so i'm trying to figure out how to just like find inspiration out of joy in making a, just a kick-ass rock record in it again because that's like you know the state that we're in now it's like all right let's keep writing i don't want to write because i'm going through x y or z or because i'm really angry i just want to write because i love being in this band and i love creating this music so there you're absolutely right though you've got to like 
consciously figure out how to get yourself out of that when you've been so entrenched in it for two years creating something like that absolutely and then there's of course the matter of playing it live so if you like are playing these songs live does it almost put you back in the same emotional headspace as you are when you're writing it or being that you know you're in a live setting with you know the fans and you know you're all playing together that maybe uh, in the live setting the song has a new emotional context behind it definitely not near as much when like when i listen to it a lot more of those emotions come back but when we're playing it live there's only a couple sections or pieces of songs where like I will, I'll actively not I can actively feel myself going back to those headspaces but it's more lyrically based when that happens not as much like the song as a whole itself or a certain riff so there's definitely spots in the lyrics from All Hail and from Death Rattle that when I hear people singing it along or just hear Corey singing it or if I get to sing it along with him it definitely puts you in a certain place, but it's easy to come out of it because you also understand that like, it wasn't just for me, it wasn't just for you, it was for all of us to experience this thing together. And it, it definitely like helps take away some of the like loneliness, I guess, if, if that's like one of the places where lyrics came from or from a song that a song came from. When you've got a room of people doing it along with you, like it's hard to feel that whole range of emotions again. 100% and like is there at all maybe though a similar energy that you channel into your live presence as you do in your songwriting or do you consider them two completely separate forms of self-expression uh, no there's definitely some like commonalities between the two like I take this shit pr all, probably too seriously at times um, like each show to me I I guess before COVID I was a little bit more loose and just enjoying the ride and everything but then after losing everything I try to treat every show or everything that we get to do in general as the last time I'm ever going to get to do it because that's how it felt <clears throat> after the last tour that we did you know we had so much more planned that was coming up really quick and then as it all started getting shut down and cancelled and all that I was like holy shit I wish I had been more conscious of each time that I played a show or did anything to like you know make it as important as it, it should have been and so that's something that I try to be really conscious of especially on this tour because it's the tour in support of that record so it's the tour supporting all the stuff that we went through to make the record you know what I mean absolutely I saw you guys I forgot who you were touring with and it's bothering me now maybe you could tell me but uh, in 2019 you guys played at Gramercy Theater um, uh, Devil Wears Prada okay yeah. so yeah on that Devil Wears Prada tour great uh, great show like um, I've noticed that you were going all into it though and I thought your crowd interaction and stage presence was truly remarkable is that almost something that you rehearse in a way do you do you like practice stage presence in a way or is that just something that comes as you play more and more it's, it's just something that comes along with it because, you know, when we rehearse at home, we're stuck in a garage outside of Corey's house, so we don't, don't have much room or anything, and we're just standing there trying to make sure we can play the songs halfway decent. So by the time we hit the stage, like, we don't ever really know what's going to happen. As you go through a tour, you, like, obviously get in grooves and, like, you know what's going to feel natural to do on a stage because you've done it 30 times now. But it's never something that's like choreographed or anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, also because you, I've seen you. You know, I'm seeing you play at like different types of rooms as well. Whether it will be, you know, Gramercy Theater. There's a barricade. It's yeah. you know like a bigger venue and security. But it all hell's gonna break loose tonight here at the Monarch, where there is no barricade. You're gonna have just as many people on the stage as off the stage. So do you think that almost uh, brings a new type of Norma Jean experience? It definitely does. Yeah, and like that's been a cool thing about this tour is we've had a decent mix of both you know we've had some shows that like in big theaters where you feel somewhat disconnected but it's also a large enough room to where you can play into just the overall loudness of it and you can almost like separate yourself in a healthy way but then when you get to have these up close and personal shows like this one it's a whole different thing you know because you can hear like every little word that's said you can hear people singing along really clearly you can you can just interact with them more and especially like a lot of our fan base is older so then when they hear the songs that like they grew up loving and you can actively like for me at least get to share that experience with them because i am coming from being a fan also it's a really cool feeling to get to do that and not always have like a five foot gap between you you know it only sucks when like my pedal board gets stepped on or unplugged by somebody and i gotta like 
try to rearrange all that. But yeah. other than that, I don't mind. Last year uh, at this venue, I saw a comeback hit in Misery Signals playing, and that shit was insane. Like, oh my god, poor Jesse. I think like there was like six people climbing on top of him. And, like, yeah, I love that shit though, for the most part. You know, like as long as like you don't get on the stage and then just sit there for five minutes. So that's the thing. It's like people gotta start planning that stuff better when you get on the stage right before we go into a two minute ambient part you know you missed your shot you got to come before that or at the end of it well i know the solution uh, i saw somebody do this at a kill switch show when they did like a special uh do the truffle tuffle oh that's, yeah that's yeah somebody, yeah somebody did that and uh i think like 80 people bought him drinks that night nice so. yeah we might have to come up with something where they gotta like slow dance or do something at least so they're not just standing up there doing this for two minutes waiting for the breakdown to kick in well distance to planets i must say is quite the stoner song maybe everybody could pull out their vapes or yeah, joints yeah, or whatever yeah. the hell they're smoking these days so. yeah we try to still incorporate some of that like because we all love bands like caius and sleep and, and stuff like that but we don't want to be a doom band so we got to be like careful how much of that we put into albums and, and stuff because it's not always not everybody likes that but we personally do so there, we try to throw in elements of that in the set with like maybe making some parts heavier with octave pedals or like playing just a section of one song that does have a really like doom riff in it because it always goes over well live you know well hey i mean you already have an eight minute song with heartache so you, i think you're pushing that boundaries you'll be on a tour with catatonia before you know it that's what i'm trying to do man like i i just want it to be like a whole experience i don't want it to be just like loud feedback from start to finish me and Corey talk all the time about having you know like peaks and valleys in the set to where like you know it's it's a still an emotional thing we want to be like a fun badass rock and roll band that like you drink beer while you listen to it and eat barbecue or whatever but there's a lot of serious shit too you know and like we don't want to leave that out of the live elements of the show either well, I could tell but just by the technical proficiency and the lyricism, and I could tell that you guys definitely take what you do seriously. You're definitely not Steel Panther. Yeah, yeah. We try to be a little bit more than that, man. <laughs> um, shout out to them as well. Um, and I have two more questions for you, but um, Norma Jean has played with a variety of different types of bands, too, like the Devil Wars Prada tour, as you mentioned, but you also did a tour with In Flames. So, like, have you noticed, and I mean... I mean, through the history of Norma Jean, Warped Tour, Mayhem Fest, Oz Fest, Summer Slaughter. So, like, have you noticed, like, maybe different types of audiences and different reactions as well? Yeah, it's it's kind of strange because we are lucky that our fans are willing. If it's, like, a support tour that we're doing, our fans will still show up, even if it is just to see us. But they're, they're good fans where they're not going to just walk out the door either the second afterwards. Like, they're open-minded for the most part. When we do tours with bands like... Prada or when we toured with Fit for a King that same year, you know, we're label mates with all those guys, so the the built-in fan base is like has a lot of crossover in it. So we do pretty well in that instance. When we did Europe with In Flames, In Flames fans are like Slipknot fans. Like, they just only want to see Slipknot, you know? And so In Flames fans are sort of the same way, but they were still cool. And Norma Jean's not one of those bands that really goes over there a whole lot. So we haven't like really put in all of the groundwork to like really settle into a fan base over there so luckily we got to do a tour like that within flames where it's a built-in you know three thousand people a night and we got to make a lot of new fans but we went into it knowing like okay these are like metal heads these are swedish metal heads that are coming to these shows and you know they were very receptive but it was a lot more trying to win the crowd over rather than like singing along with each other you know what i mean yeah, of course, but in flames as well. I mean, you know, for and I'm, this is going to lead me into the final question, but like they were a huge inspiration for the metalcore movement as well. So in the end, I think their fans were also kind of in a way being exposed to their legacy. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's kind of the same thing with this band. Like, they're they are a little bit older than us, but they're they much like Norma Jean helped carve out a sound in the you know the lanes that they both existed in so it's cool to be with the band like that that understands the role that they had and their fan base understands it as well and i think that's why that they were receptive us receptive to us because you know they understand that their band that their favorite band if it's in flames doesn't sound like they did on the first in flames record you know and same thing with us so like they're that type of fan base whenever it's a usual for the most part at least when it's an older band that has a pretty eclectic discography their fans are going to be more open-minded to accept a band that's trying to squeeze in 
eight or nine records worth of songs in 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for such an awesome uh, conversation. It's really great to be able to talk, finally have Norma Jean on the show. Is there just uh, anything else with Norma Jean that you would like to promote uh, with uh, the release of Death Rattle, uh, Sing For Me, uh, in terms of other upcoming tours or maybe even new music in the works? I mean, just buying the music, streaming the new records, streaming All Hail, streaming any of the other like hundred records that came before it. That's the best thing for us, you know. Um, if this comes out while we're still on this tour, you can buy tickets, you can buy VIP, you can buy the record, you can watch all of our media, everything at normagenenoise.com. So that's just the best spot for everything across the board. But uh, yeah, we can't really talk about anything else we've got right now because nothing's announced yet, but uh, we definitely have a lot of plans to keep going. Hell yeah. And look forward, just come back to New York, please. A- absolutely, dude. I love it here. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody, we are here with Norma Jean, Death Rattlesing for me. Pick that up if you haven't already. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York.